although he's away today, no, have no fear, he will be back next week uh, to host uh, next week's session. But in the meantime, you all have me. And the goal of this uh, series, of course, is to bridge the exciting developments in biology and engineering uh, with developments in medicine. And of course, these areas have grown so much that one simply can't have all of that information in one person's head, it would explode. And so consequently, we have to establish a dialogue, a discourse between uh, experts in biology and engineering and medicine so that we can actually learn some new things. And that dialogue crackles every Tuesday afternoon from four until six, from the 4th of January to the 3rd of May. Uh, the uh, 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 URL address uh, for this uh, exciting adventure uh, is shown on the slide, uh, the video cast uh, address, and the course schedule is listed uh, on this first slide as well. Uh, for those of you who attend at least 50% of the sessions and pass a very uh, friendly uh, examination, final examination, uh, you will receive a certificate and get CME for attendance in this course. And the CME credit number for today is 38647. Remember that number. Uh, so anyway, if during the course of the presentation, a question occurs to you, you can use the send live feedback uh, button uh, on the video cast display to enter your question. And then at the end, I will be moderating and I will pose your question uh, to the, uh, the speakers and we will see if we can stump them. Uh, but in any case, all of the previous sessions are archived as shown here on the first slide. And for additional uh, information, uh, you can email uh, Dr. Arias. Now, uh, let's have the next slide. And you can see that iconic photo taken by Dr. Arias's grandfather back at the time of the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, which, for those of you who aren't aware, is a bridge between Manhattan, the borough of Manhattan, or it was Manhattan Island at that time, and Brooklyn. Brooklyn was a separate city, uh, but the Brooklyn Bridge brought the two of them together. And you can see on the left, those two guys on the catwalk. One of them is actually a basic scientist from Manhattan, and the other is a clinician from Brooklyn. And they are there talking about uh, probably uh, the... Uh, uh, the cholera pandemic of the 1870s, I think, and, and uh, exchanging information just as we are going to uh, this afternoon. If we can have the next slide, we'll see who are our speakers. And uh, the title of today's talk is the, the Mighty Mitochondrion and Its Diseases, the Parkinson's Dossier. Uh, so uh, uh, one of our speakers is Dr. Richard Ewell, uh, and he is a, C a senior investigator and chief of the biochemistry section of the surgical neurology branch of NINDS. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Albion College in Michigan, his PhD from the University of South Carolina. He did a postdoc post uh, with uh, Dr. David Neville in NINDS. Uh, and then took on his uh, faculty position uh, here at the NIH. He is the recent recipient in 2021 of the Breakthrough Prize uh, in Life Sciences, and he's also a member of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His research interests over the years have included the role of the BCL2 family of proteins and their movement through mitochondria in regulating program cell death, the role of mitochondrial quality control and susceptibility to neurodegenerative diseases, and the role of innate immunity in neurodegenerative diseases. If I can have the next slide, uh, we will see who is the other speaker, who is actually going to be the first speaker uh, this afternoon, and that is Dr. Derek Narendra, MD, PhD, who is a Lasker Clinical Research Scholar Investigator, head of the Inherited Movement Disorders Unit of the Neurogenetics Branch of NINDS. Uh, he received his, his bachelor's degree from Columbia University, his PhD from Cambridge University, and his medical degree from the University of Michigan. He did a neurology residency at Harvard and a movement disorders fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. 
His research interests have included the role of Parkin and Pink One, Pink One uh, in mitochondrial quality control and susceptibility to Parkinson's disease, the role of DJ1, this jockey one, and CHCHD2 in mitochondrial biology and Parkinson's disease, and the molecular pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease and the development of disease modifying therapies. So uh, at this juncture, we are ready to be demystified and I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Narendra. Derek, take it away. Great, um, are you able to see my screen okay? Indeed. So I'm, I'm pleased to be able to present to you some of our research that is focused on mitochondria and neurodegeneration. And in particular, we're gonna focus on Parkinson's disease and the pathway that Richard and I identified that um, involves the degradation of dysfunctional mitochondria um, in the cell that when it is mutated, ends up causing Parkinson's disease. So first let me describe to you what Parkinson's disease is. So it consists of a clinical, uh, clinical syndrome of um, uh, specific motor symptoms that include bradykinesia, which also means slow movements, tremor that's predominantly seen at rest, rigidity, which means if you try to move the arms or legs or neck of somebody with Parkinson's disease, you feel that there's a lot of resistance, and postural instability. So if somebody with Parkinson's disease gets a little bit off balance, they'll fall, whereas you or I might be able to regain our, our, our posture and prevent a fall. Um, so that can be a significant uh, source of morbidity in patients with Parkinson's disease. That these symptoms are due to loss of dopamine neurons that are concentrated in the midbrain. These neurons project to a part of the brain called the basal ganglia that's important for um, motor control. And so loss of these neurons and that dopamine input results in these symptoms that are characteristic of uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, these uh, neurons appear dark um, in the midbrain um, where their cell bodies are. And so in the adult, you'll see this dark stripe. That's the, the cells um, that represent these dopamine neurons. But in the Parkinson's disease brain, as those neurons die, you lose that sort of dark stripe that you see um, in the Parkinsonian brain. And in those cells that um, are affected in Parkinson's disease, um, in the surviving cells, you can see that there is a protein inclusion that will often form in the, in the cell body um, that's known as a Lewy body. Um, and that contains a protein called alpha-synuclein that tends to misfold um, into this big aggregate of, of protein. Um, and within those Lewy bodies, you have the alpha-synuclein that's misfolded, but you also have membrane that's from a lot of different organelles in the cell, including um, mitochondria, which is being shown here by all those orange arrows. And some of these mitochondria will be found deep inside of the uh, Lewy body, but more of them kind of concentrate um, in a corona around the outside of the Lewy body. Um, so really these Lewy bodies are, are a mix of these misfolded proteins of alpha-synuclein mixed up with um, different organelles. Um, mitochondria are, are a prominent source of, of those uh, damaged um, organelles. So for a long time, it was thought that Parkinson's disease was not a genetic disorder. Um, but over the last 20 years, um, we've come to appreciate that there's a significant contribution of genetics to Parkinson's disease. In about five to 10% of cases, you have a Mendelian cause of the disease. So that means there's a mutation in the single gene that's responsible. Um, and some of these are dominant causes of Parkinson's disease. This includes mutations in alpha-synuclein itself, which is that protein that misfolds. And then also in LARC2, which is the most common dominant cause of Parkinson's disease. Um, and also recessive mutations. So here you need to get two mutations, one from mom and one from dad to get the disease. Um, and the size of the circles here represent um, how frequent those mutations are in the population. You can see that Parkin and Pink 1 are the most common recessive causes of Parkinson's disease. Now in the 90% of individuals that don't have a Mendelian cause of Parkinson's disease, genetics are still playing a factor. Um, and we consider these to be polygenic uh, uh, Risk. So you have multiple genes that have alleles that are common in the population, um, but each of which confers a very small risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And from genome-wide association studies, we think about 25% of the risk of developing Parkinson's disease is due to these polygenic risk factors. And from GWAS studies, we know um, about 90 specific um, loci that are responsible for that risk, and that accounts for about 30% 
of the, the total risk that we estimate is there. And we think that with larger and larger GWAS studies, we'll be able to explain more and more of the specific loci that are responsible for that risk. And in between these extremes, there are uh, mutations that substantially increase the risk of Parkinson's disease, but don't quite rise to um, being causal for Parkinson's disease. And this includes heterozygous variants in a gene called GBA. So that increases your risk of Parkinson's disease by about five to tenfold. And then a common variant in LARC2. Um, and this is, causes a dominant form of Parkinson's disease, but it has what we call decreased penetrance. So not everybody that has this mutation gets the disease. And in fact, only about 25 to 50% of individuals that have that particular mutation end up getting Parkinson's disease. So the majority of people with this mutation don't actually get the disease. And so these sort of fall between these two extremes of these common polygenic risk factors and then these rare monogenic risk factors for Parkinson's disease. Now, three of these, uh, Parkin pink one and CHD2 are uh, monogenic genes associated with Parkinson's disease that primarily impact mitochondria. So this is gonna be the focus of what we talk about today. Um, and the first one we're gonna talk about is Parkin and pink one that um, we have found uh, function together in a common pathway that's important for mitochondrial quality control. Um, and then um, later in the talk, I'll come back and tell you about some more recent work we've been doing with CCHD2 that's actually a dominant cause of Parkinson's disease that we think is working a little bit differently than how Parkin and pink one are, are acting. Um, so Parkin was actually the second gene that was identified as a cause of Parkinson's disease. The first one was alpha-synuclein, and Parkin was um, found just a year later. And it had been recognized in Japan for a long time that there were these families, often with parents who were related to one another in some way, um, who um, had Parkinson's disease that had a very early onset, so typically before the age of 40. Um, in studying one of these families, uh, Katata and others were able to identify that there was a homozygous deletion that affected about half the exons in a novel gene at the time called Parkin. Um, and you know it was novel because they named it Parkin. If it had you know, some other known function, they might've called it something, you know, it would have had that other name. And we now know that you can have Parkinson's disease, not only from uh, deletions in Parkin, but also from other loss of function mutations. And so this represents our experience at the NIH over about 13 years. Um, we collected uh, samples in collaboration with Andy Singleton's group, um, and then looked at um, the disease causing Parkin mutations. And about a third of them are deletions that involve one or more exons in Parkin. About a third of them are frame shift mutations and about a third of them are missense mutations. Um, and this is probably uh, pretty representative of what you'd see at least in the European population in terms of the relative proportion of different classes of mutations. Um, so uh, we wanted to know just how common these are um, among uh, Parkinson's disease cohorts. And traditionally this has been a little bit difficult because um, you can have lots of different loss of function mutations in Parkin. Um, you could have two different ones that might cause disease. So you have to be able to identify both of them. And they can be different kinds of mutations. So one could be a deletion or duplication on one allele, and then the other allele might have a missense mutation. And sometimes you need different methods to identify one versus the other. But one thing that's been very helpful is a public-private partnership um, called AMPPD, where they brought together a number of study cohorts that had uh, DNA samples from individuals and then produced um, a harmonized um, whole genome sequencing data set from these individuals. Um, and then in collaboration with Andy Singleton's lab, we went through this data set and then identified um, those that had two mutations in Parkin. So where we think that um, these individuals have complete loss of Parkin function. And we found that about half a percent of individuals with Parkinson's disease had these two Parkin mutations. Now, as I told you before, individuals with Parkin mutations get Parkinson's disease younger than the typical age that you get Parkinson's disease. So as a sanity check, we looked at how old these individuals were um, at the time that they were participating in these studies. And if you had two Parkin mutations, you were about 40 years old on average, whereas the average age for individuals who didn't have Parkin mutations was closer to 60. Um, so that you know, let, us, let us know that we were on the right track, that we were really picking out um, disease causing Parkin mutations. We also want to know how common these Parkin variants are in the general population. And for this, we turn to a data set called the UK Biobank, where they have um, data available from about half a million individuals 
Um, and some of the, these data are from genotyping microarrays. And from those, you can pick up copy number variants, such as um, loss of um, part of the Parkin gene that affects an axon or gain of a part of the Parkin gene that um, results in gain of an axon. Um, and we identified those in about 0.6% of individuals in the UK. Um, and from whole exome sequencing data, we found a likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant in another 1.2%. Um, and so altogether, there are about 2% of individuals in the UK that have a loss of function variant in Parkin. Um, so although these variants are individually rare in the population, as a group, we think that they're um, actually common in the population. We think this is probably representative of at least your uh, populations of European ancestry. Um, so Parkin also looks a little bit different in terms of how it presents. Um, I already mentioned that you get Parkinson's disease much younger when you have Parkin mutations, um, but the progression also tends to be slower if you have Parkin mutations. So this patient developed Parkinson's disease when she was 37, um, and she's seen here 19 years later. Um, and she's actually still moving pretty well and on a relatively low dose of the main treatment for the Parkinsonian symptoms, um, levodopa, which is the precursor to dopamine. But what she does have is a lot of extra movements. So in addition to the movements we're asking her to do, you'll see that her legs are shaking and um, she has some movements in her shoulder. Um, and when she walks, you can see that there are these extra movements that she has, even though she's walking pretty well. And these are actually a complication of the uh, medications that we're using to treat the symptoms. These are known as levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And uh, in Parkinson's disease, due to Parkin mutations, these levodopa-induced dyskinesias can actually occur uh, much more severely and occur much earlier. Um, and this is actually what has limited um, being able to give her higher doses of medication um, and actually is the symptom that bothers her the most. Um, so these are ways in which the phenotype is a little bit different for Parkin versus idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Another way in which Parkin patients are different than idiopathic Parkinson's disease is they don't have those characteristic Lewy bodies in many cases. And in fact, you only see Lewy bodies in about 25% of autopsy cases um, um, in patients that have Parkinson's disease due to Parkin mutations. Um, so the majority don't have these Lewy bodies. Um, the um, autopsy data is, is pretty scarce from genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. And so what we decided to do was to um, try to look in another place to see if we could see evidence of alpha-synuclein deposition. And for the last 10 years or so, it's been known that you can look at alpha-synuclein and actually see it in sympathetic nerve fibers from skin biopsies. Um, and David Goldstein and Arisa Isanaka um, had been doing this work um, to look at um, autonomic dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. Um, and we're able to show that you get substantially more alpha-synuclein deposition in these um, uh, sympathetic nerve fibers um, in the skin um, in Parkinson's disease than you do in controls. So we decided to collaborate as we're starting to see more and more of these patients with monogenic forms of Parkinson's disease and ask, um, which of these monogenic forms of Parkinson's disease have synuclein deposition and which ones don't? Um, and we found, um, not surprisingly, that if you have a mutation in synuclein itself, that's associated with increased synuclein deposition. Um, if you have a mutation in this dominant form of Parkinson's disease, LARP2, you also see excess um, synuclein deposition or in GBA. But the Parkin patients really stand out as having a very low synuclein deposition in their, in their peripheral nerve fibers. This is really consistent with the autopsy data that I was uh, showing you earlier. So I've told you a lot about what Parkin looks like clinically, but what does Parkin actually do? And the first clue that it might have something to do with mitochondria actually came from studies in Drosophila, in particular from um, Leo Planck's group, um, published in, in 2003. And what they found is if you knock out Parkin from the Drosophila, they have a very characteristic phenotype. And one part of it is the flies don't climb very well. And if you look in their thorax, you see that there's an indentation and their wings have a weird posture. And this is all indicating that the indirect, fly, uh, the indirect uh, flight muscles are abnormal um, in these Drosophila. And if you look in these flight muscles by EM, you see the normal um, electron-dense mitochondria um, in the control flies, um, but if you look in the Parkin knockout flies, the mitochondria look swollen and they look abnormally enlarged. Um, the other thing they noticed in these flies was that the males are sterile. 
And if they looked at the spermatids to see what might be going wrong, um, overall, they looked okay, except for this derivative of the mitochondria um, being pointed out by those arrows called the nebenkern. So this is a hyperfused mitochondrion that provides all the energy that's needed for these really motile cells. And um, what they found is that, that that structure was very abnormal. So this indicated that mitochondria seem to have really gone awry in these Parkin knockout flies, but exactly the reason wasn't clear um, at that point. Um, so the next um, really key to sort of figuring out what Parkin uh, was doing was identifying that not everyone who has early onset Parkinson's disease has a mutation in Parkin. And in fact, there were these other families that um, had no mutation in Parkin, but still looked a lot like patients who had Parkin mutations. Um, and one of those families, um, they found the uh, causative mutations in another gene called PINK1 for uh, P10-induced kinase 1. Um, and we're able to show that this is a, uh, a protein kinase that localizes to the mitochondria. So PINK1 was the first PD gene that was directly linked to the mitochondria. And shortly after this was published by Nick Wood's group in 2004, a number of Drosophila groups independently knocked out PINK1 and observed that surprisingly, the phenotype of these PINK1 knockout flies looks exactly like the Parkin phenotype. And in fact, you can knock out both Parkin and PINK1 and you have the exact same phenotype. And if you overexpress Parkin in the PINK1 knockout flies, you can partially rescue the phenotype, but the converse wasn't true. So PINK1 couldn't overrescue Parkin knockout flies. And together, this suggested that Parkin and PINK1 are part of a common pathway that affects mitochondria, and that PINK1 operates upstream of Parkin in that pathway. So this is what was known when I came to the NIH for the first time as an HHMI NIH scholar um, in 2007. Um, and I, I lived here in the cloister building where medical students who, like myself, were taking a gap year um, um, still live um, to, to do work at the NIH. Um, and eventually, I ended up taking more than just one gap year. I ended up doing an MD-PhD through the Oxford Cambridge program um, because I you know, had um, really caught the bug for doing science. And I joined Richard Ewell's lab, um, where a couple of postdocs at the time um, were focused on apoptosis and had found that a protein that looks a lot like Parkin, it's another E3 ubiquitin ligase, was recruited to mitochondria during apoptosis and seemed to be modulating backs. So and so that was what was on everyone's mind sort of at the time. And so Richard, as sort of a side project suggested, Derek, why don't you take a look at Parkin, you're interested in Parkinson's disease and see if it might be recruited to mitochondria also during apoptosis. So I went through the lab and um, gathered a number of mitochondrial toxins and stressors and um, things that induce apoptosis and tried a number of them. And the typical things that induce apoptosis didn't change the localization of Parkin, it stayed in the cytosol. Um, but I found one drug called CCP, um, when you add it to the cells, um, change the behavior of Parkin. And just to explain what CCP is for a minute, it's an uncoupler of mitochondria. So mitochondria have an inner membrane uh, potential, and this drives ATP synthesis. But what CCP does is it dissipates that membrane potential. So you can no longer make ATP from your mitochondria. And this is reversible. So if you wash out the CCP, then the uh, membrane potential comes back and the mitochondria can make ATP again. So this is a way of reversibly causing a bioenergetic deficit um, in the mitochondria. And so we added the CCP, there was initial lag of about 30 seconds or so, but then uh, we found that Parkin was really robustly recruited to the mitochondria um, in just about every cell that we looked at and seemed to be recruited just to about every mitochondria that we looked at. Um, so this was really striking and we wanted to know why was Parkin being recruited to these depolarized mitochondria? Um, and so we uh, worked on this for a while and eventually we got the idea of um, why don't we just try treating mitochondria with CCP for a longer period of time? We weren't sure what would happen. We thought maybe the cells would just die, but we thought we might as well give it a try. And what we found is that the mitochondria, if you treat the CCP for 12 hours, were very reduced in their number, and those that remained um, tended to gather in this cluster in the perinuclear localization. And if we treated for 24 hours or 48 hours, we had an even more striking phenotype where we couldn't detect mitochondria in the cell at all. And um, we worried, you know, could this just be um, something about the staining that we were doing? So we did 
electron microscopy. And again, what we found is that there was no evidence of mitochondria in these cells that had had been expressing Parkin and been depolarized for these long periods of time. And instead, what we saw is that there were a lot of lysosomes that were where the mitochondria should be. And this gave us our first clue that maybe the mitochondria were being degraded at the lysosome through a process that's known as autophagy. And so in autophagy, you have something called an autophagosome that will form around a mitochondria, will allow it to be delivered to the lysosome. And so we looked at a marker of these autophagosomes called LC3. And in cells that weren't expressing Parkin but had been treated with, CCC, with CCCP, um, you'd see an increase in these autophagosomes, but they were rather small and they weren't particularly associated with mitochondria. If Parkin was present, however, we found that um, these would tend to form these rings around the mitochondria, would completely surround them. So this was consistent with the idea that the mitochondria were being degraded uh, by uh, autophagy. And what really uh, convinced us that, that this was the case is if we had a cell line that lacked um, the autophagy process because it was lacking one of the key genes, ATG5, that's involved in uh, macroautophagy, um, that we could block this degradation of mitochondria. So together, this suggested the following model to us, that a mitochondrion was somehow being damaged. Parkin was somehow able to recognize that damaged mitochondria. Parkin was known to be an E3 ubiquitin ligase, so we assumed it was probably ubiquitinating something on the surface of mitochondria, although we didn't know what at the time. Um, and that was acting as a signal for this mitochondria to be selectively encaptured by an autophagosome and then delivered to a lysosome to be degraded. So our next question was, what was upstream of Parkin in this pathway? And in particular, could PINK1 be upstream of Parkin given what we knew from those Drosophila studies? And so we tested this and what we found is that indeed, PINK1 is strictly required for Parkin recruitment to these dysfunctional mitochondria. Um, so if we have PINK1 knockout cells, we no longer see um, that targeting of Parkin to these mitochondria. Um, but we can restore it if we put PINK1 back into these cells. Um, so this put PINK1 um, upstream of Parkin in this, in this pathway. Um, but there were still a number of questions, such as, what is PINK1 substrate? It's known to be a kinase on the mitochondria. What is it phosphorylating? And how is that involved in this pathway? Um, and then how is it that ubiquitination is then promoting metophagy to occur? Um, and then uh, to sort of answer these questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Richard to tell you about how this uh, story progressed then in his lab. Thanks, Derek. So I'll just summarize very quickly what Derek discovered in his two years of his PhD in my lab. He found that Pink one is stabilized selectively on damaged mitochondria. That pink one recruits Parkin from the cytosol to the mitochondria, shown in that video of his, and that it causes the elimination of autophagosomes. And he showed in his first paper if you have two mitochondria right next to each other, one is damaged that will be eliminated by this pathway. And that suggested that was like the first hint. Um, that pink one and Parkin mediate mitochondrial quality control. It's quite, quite spectacular work for two years. And then he headed in the OxCam program off to the UK and several postdocs of mine helped unravel further molecular mechanisms. So many stresses can cause Parkin translocation to the mitochondria. Derek showed you the work with CCCP, but other agents that um, depolarized mitochondria, also genetic damage to mitochondria. Mitochondria have their own DNA and, uh, and, and, and other mutations in mitochondrial fusion and patient cells will call, have Parkin translocation, oxidative damage. And quite interestingly, unfolded proteins without depolarizing the mitochondrial membrane can cause Parkin recruitment. So, so what's the common denominator? How does this work? Well, as I mentioned, Derek found pink one accumulates on the mitochondria. And that's the common denominator with all those stresses. So how does it accumulate? So, so what we found is, is doing a Western blot for pink one. Now, if you have a, a DMSO is just a, a, a buffer control, you actually don't see much pink one in the mitochondria or in the cell. And this 
It was already known by other people. And it was said that the antibodies against pink one don't work very well. They're, we need better antibodies. But then we found if you add this uncoupler that Derek used, CCCP, if we expose cells to that for three hours, bingo, there's this really bite band of pink one, the exact molecular weight. But since the literature said the antibodies don't work, we had to go to the nth degree to prove that this actually is pink one. And we did, and it is pink one. So the antibodies work just fine. It's just there isn't any pink one or very little pink one detectable in normal cells. It's conditional upon depolarizing the mitochondria. Now, if you wash the CCCP out, it's very uh, reversible. In two and a half minutes of washout, the pink one's almost completely gone. More than T1, T1 half of less than two and a half minutes. Five minutes is, is back down to baseline. So this was really quite informative, saying it turns over very rapidly, likely a protease. So we, uh, Scott Jin in my lab, scanned all the proteases in the mitochondria, and he found one specific protease named PARL was mediating this elimination of pink one. And a PARL is an interesting protease. It's a rhomboid protease multi-spanning across the mitochondrial inner membrane. And here's the mitochondria. It's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And PARL is specifically in this compartment. And the import of proteins like PINK1 occurs across both of these membranes. So anyway, we found it in an RNAi screen, but we confirmed it with knockout cells, of PARL knockout cells. You see in lane one, there's, there's plenty, there's, there's no PINK1 there, but it's, it appears without PARL. There's a minor cleavage of the import peptidase. But the pink one is in the and CCP, it does not accumulate like it does over here because it's already there and it's not degraded. So this defined that. And then a series of other papers, mainly from my lab, but also from Nick Wood, the discoverer of pink one, unveiled a, a pathway that happens in normal, healthy cells. It's happening in almost all of our cells right now. Pink one, this kinase is imported. This is its mitochondrial targeting sequence. And that sequence is what told Nick Wood to look at the mitochondria. It's, it's a normal signal that targets proteins into the mitochondria. So it's imported through the outer membrane Tom complex and through the inner membrane Tim complex. And that's where PARL, this protease resides. And now it gets imported at this point and then PARL clips it right there. And that generates a new N-terminus at the cleavage site. And it's a phenylalanine. And my very clever postdoc, Koji Yamano, realized that is a, a, a degron, a signal for the NN rule pathway of proteasomal degradation discovered by uh, Alex Varshavsky. And so this pathway, it's being translated, imported, clipped, and degraded. And that steady state process is going on in our cells right now. And that yields lane one, that yields the steady state level. Now, we know that imports, the Tom complex does not require membrane potential. Membrane potential of, that drives oxidative, that drives ATP synthesis is across the inner membrane. And that membrane potential is required for import into the Tim complex where the PARL is. So if we depolarize mitochondria by any, many different means, it prevents pink one from being imported into that compartment. So if you block import to that compartment, for example, by CCCP or, or uh, other uh, or, uh, genetic damage, the pink one never sees the PARL. It doesn't get clipped and it accumulates bound to the Tom complex through this subunit of the Tom7. And from there with the kinase facing the cytosol, it recruits Parkin from the cytosol to the mitochondria. And that requires its kinase function. So this solves a, 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 a part of the puzzle of how pink one senses mitochondrial damage. And it's quite interesting is if you have two mitochondria right next door to each other, one of them will be importing, clipping and degrading pink one. It's completely resistant to this process. Whereas right next door, there can be a damaged mitochondria. The pink one does not get clipped, accumulates on the outer membrane and recruits Parkin from the cytosol to the mitochondria. So that's a, so pink one is a, a very elegant sensor of mitochondrial damage. And it's through the sensing mechanism of PARL, it uses its kinase function to recruit Parkin only to the damaged mitochondria. 
So how does pink one recruit parking? Well, we know it needs its kinase function. So what is it phosphorylating? So uh, an obvious candidate would be maybe it's phosphorylating parkin. And there were several papers early on in the literature that argued this point, but we couldn't confirm any of them until this paper came out by Miratil Muckett in Scotland. And he's, this paper reported that PINK1 phosphorylates parkin in the ubiquitin-like domain. Now, ubiquitin is a post-translational modification. It's a small 73 amino acid polypeptide chain that is linked to other proteins, and it can trigger degradation or it can trigger autophagy. And parkin is an E3 ligase, so it's kind of interesting is parkin is puts ubiquitin on other proteins, but it's got a sequence homologous to ubiquitin itself. And Muckett's group said, showed that it, the serine 65 in this ubiquitin like domain is ubiquitin, is phosphorylated by PINK1. And we could confirm that result. But when we mutated that serine 65 to alanine, so it couldn't be phosphorylated, PINK1 would still recruit Parkin to the mitochondria through its kinase function. So we knew that wasn't the whole story. So we kept searching. And I had a great postdoc, Leslie Kane, a mass spectrometrist. And she'd struggled for four years to try to figure out the pink one substrate. She got more sophisticated and more sophisticated and CRISPR technology was developed and we made pink one knockout cells. And the bottom line is she purified mitochondria from wild type cells or from pink one knockout cells. And then she added uh, that had been treated with CCCP. First, she depolarizes the mitochondria to accumulate pink one. And of course, it doesn't accumulate here. There is no pink one. And she isolated these mitochondria and she shaved off the peptides on the cell surface because we knew pink one was facing the cytosol. And so she shaved these peptides off. These are purified mitochondria. And she then ran the peptides that came off the surface through mass spectrometry looking for phosphopeptides. And the one biggest difference between wild type and pink one knockouts was this peptide. And I just remember the day she brought it into my laboratory, into my office. So is this peptide right here, she identified, and this serine was phosphorylated. Now, no one has ever thought of ubiquitin being phosphorylated before, because ubiquitin is a post-translational modification. But her, she identified this peptide of ubiquitin was a substrate of pink one. And the beauty is it was serine 65. It's the exact homologous residue that Muckett had already shown in the homologous ubiquitin like domain is phosphorylated by Parkin. So we confirmed this by using recombinant pink one and recombinant ubiquitin and showed it, um, that it would be phosphorylated by pink one. So, so that's, and we also know that it is, since these are purified, the pink one is phosphorylated ubiquitin chains that are already on the mitochondria. And that's what I denote on this picture here. These little green trees are ubiquitin chains attached to mitochondrial proteins. So what, what could this be doing? So we knew pink one recruited Parkin through its kinase domain. So maybe phosphorylated ubiquitin on the mitochondria is a receptor for Parkin. So we took recombinant Parkin and we mixed it with, with um, phosphoubiquitin or with, that, or with just plain ubiquitin. We put it in a test tube with the other reagents to measure ubiquitination. And it also requires ATP. And if you get, if you ubiquitinate proteins, so there's a number of proteins in here, Parkin can even ubiquitinate itself. So you get this large ladder of chains. Each one of these would be a different, would be one and more and more, more ubiquitins on these proteins in this soup. But Parkin's actually a very poor ubiquitin ligase. It needs ubiquitin to ubiquitinate things. So this is a substrate of Parkin, but you don't really don't see much ladder. Now, if you add four nanograms of phosphoubiquitin, you see a little bit of increase. But if you add 20 nanograms, wow, you turn it from off to on. This phosphoubiquitin activates Parkin's ubiquitin ligase activity. And this is going to happen on the surface of the mitochondria. And the, the Muckett group and, uh, and, and Matsuda in Japan, and we independently discovered this by different mechanisms. We all published the same month together. So it was a very robust result. And many people explored this and expanded on this whole idea, but it explains how pink one recruits Parkin. 
pink wine gets stabilized. It phosphorylates ubiquitin chains already on the mitochondria. Parkin in the cytosol binds to those chains. And upon binding to those chains, it is turned from off to on. So now pink parkin ubiquitin ligase puts more chains on. And that gets phosphorylated by more pink one. And I'll just show you that this, this makes a powerful feedback amplification. So ubiquitin is already on mitochondria. Pink one gets stabilized and makes these chains into fossil ubiquitin that binds inactive parkin to activate it. And the product of parkin is the substrate of pink one. And the product of pink one is the allosteric activator of parkin. And it shows really an intimate relationship between two independently discovered Parkinson's disease genes. One's a ubiquitin kinase and the other's a ubiquitin ligase. And that also explains why Derek, in that movie he showed you of Parkin translocation, that was greatly overexpressed YFP Parkin. Now, if it was going to a mitochondria binding some substrate, or some receptor on the mitochondria, it would be vastly outnumbering and you probably wouldn't see it. But Parkin is actually creating its own receptor which is fossil ubiquitin by putting chains on the mitochondria that pink one phosphorylates. And, the, and this go, this, once this thing gets started, it doesn't stop. And that's probably the purpose is not to go back and forth. It's to go one way and drive the, uh, the elimination of these mitochondria. And these results have been corroborated since our, our, our work on it by, uh, by the structural biologists. Uh, Kaylee Gehring and McGill solved the structure of Parkin and cytosol, and you can tell by the active site it's inactive. And David Commander at the, in, in Cambridge, UK, did determine the structure of the kinase pink one. And he did it with ubiquitin bound into the active site, and you can see that the serine 65 is right in the kinase uh, active site, consistent with it being the substrate. And then Comander had another paper showing the structure of Parkin bound to the phospho pink one, showing how the, I mean, the phospho ubiquitin, showing how the phospho laid ubiquitin causes a drastic conformational change that turns Parkin from the off state to the on state. So this is all, all very well accepted. Now, we've gotten to this point in the pathway. So how do ubiquitin chains trigger elimination? Well, the model at the time, and this is taken from a review uh, you know, in, in, in this journal, that Parkin would ubiquitinate mitochondria and P62 would bind ubiquitin. This is some kind of adapter protein. It binds ubiquitin and binds autophagosomes. And that was the model of how this would work. But Derek, on top of his other work, he also examined P62 knockout cells. And he found that there was no deficit in Parkin activity. It didn't require P62, so what did it? And also, coincidentally, uh, the person who made the P62 knockout mouse, Kumatsu in Japan, published, um, was it back-to-back, -back, Derek? Uh, the, same, the same result. So it was quite a mystery of how these ubiquitin chains would be eliminated. So instead of, you know, there are a number of autophagy receptors identified in the literature, and we could be wandering around doing one or the other, maybe it's some combination, maybe it's something else. So we, I had some really, uh, really excellent, hardworking postdocs and an excellent staff scientist named Black, who's a CRISPR guru. So instead of going one by one, they knocked out all five in one cell line. So these are HeLa cells lacking all of these five known autophagy receptors. And the first thing is to see maybe none of them are involved. So this is looking at mitophagy. This is a mitochondrial elimination like Derek showed, but over the years, the, the assays became more and more sophisticated. So here we're looking at the mitochondrial DNA itself. See, so the, the blue is the nuclear DNA, that's the nucleus. And the little green speckles are the, the mitochondrial DNA genome in the mitochondria. And that's what cells normally look like. Now, if you depolarize cells expressing Parkin, in three hours, they get clumped up. But in 24 hours, it's almost completely eliminated. And that's what Derek had showed measuring other markers of the mitochondria. So then we looked at the same process in the 5KO, we call it, in the cells lacking all five of these. And what you see is, you see the green speckles? 
and you see they get a little bit clumpy, but they don't go away. They're essentially completely retained, indicating one of these involves. So then we, we knew we were onto something. So we knocked out in various combinations of single, doubles, triples. And then we, uh, we identified the rank order of the autophagy receptors. And I'll just to quickly summarize, and also we can do rescue experiments. So we put P62 back in, no effect, just like Derek said. But NDP52 and OptiNeuron are both, uh, are both able to induce this mitophagy. And the rank order is NDP52 first, OptiNeuron second. And OptiNeuron works with a kinase called TBK1. And I mention that because mutations in OptiNeuron or TBK1 lead to ALS. And also what's interesting to me is that NDP52 and opineurin are the two autophagy receptors previously shown to be involved in eliminating pathogenic bacteria. So autophagy is one of our strategies to eliminate, for example, salmonella when it in invades our cells. And it requires these two. So the same two autophagy receptors that eliminate mitochondria eliminate bacteria. And that's interesting because Back, mitochondria descended from uh, an endosymbiotic bacteria uh, a billion years ago. And most recently, we found how these actually recruit the autophagosome. So they do bind to the ubiquitin chains on mitochondria, and they recruit the autophagosome by binding directly to the most upstream FIP200 ALK1 autophagy complex. So this quite nicely unravels many, most of the details of this pathway. And this is a nice EM picture from the Japanese group who looked at Parkin uh, activation and you see how it can engulf multiple mitochondria at the same time. So these biochemical cell biology studies indicate it's a quality control system, but what, what's, what's going on in vivo? So we, um, we found that pink one can be activated by, by exercise, by, uh, by exhaustive exercise. Now we, use, we have two assays on this slide. One is looking at fossil ubiquitin in the heart. Remember, this is the substrate we found for pink one. And if you have normal heart tissue, you've got a little bit of evidence of, of, of pink one activity, but if you exercise it, exercise the mice, it goes up substantially. And if you look at pink one knockout, there's there's none in sedentary animals and no increase upon exercise. So this also points out that there's some of this process going on in steady state in mouse hearts uh, in, in, the, in the cages in, in the bottom of this building. And it's pink one dependent, but stressing the heart induces more of it. And there's a, a nice assay to look at mitophagy. And this is called mitokaima. It's a, a sensor that you can detect a color shift upon low pH when mitochondria go into the endosomes, I mean, into the lysosomes. And this is developed uh, by a Japanese group. And uh, we were fortunate to, at the NIH because Torin Finkel was in building 10 at the time. And he and his postdoc Nuo son made a mitochema mouse. So uh, generous gift from them using their mouse. We showed that you see this amount of yellow in the heart of the sedentary mouse. Well, if you exercise it, it goes up significantly. And if you take, an, if you exercise um, a wild type mouse in this experiment and you compare it with a pink one knockout mouse, it doesn't go up substantially. Again, showing different assays to show this mitophagy, pink one dependent mitophagy is occurring in vivo. And there's some more evidence closer to the Parkinson's disease phenotype in this really nice paper by, by Jim Surmeyer from Northwestern. And he, he's pointed out in his prior work that there's two dopaminergic neuron clusters in the brain. And uh, I'm just thinking this, is, must, this must be a mouse or a rat. And one's the ventral tegmental area, one's the, the substantia nigra pars compactum. And this is lost selectively during, uh, during Parkinson's disease and not this. So and interesting, this cluster has pacemaker activity. So this is beating like your heart all the time, your whole life, giving a tonic level of dopamine to the striatum. And this is not. And so Sir Meyer is 
pointed out that this may be the reason, this pacemaker activity may be why these are selectively vulnerable. So he put in this it's the same sensor, mitokinema, into, into his mice, and he looked at steady state autophagy of these different brain regions. And he points out it's much higher in those neurons that are lost during Parkinson's disease. Now, people, since Parkinson's disease was discovered, people wondered, you know, why dopaminergic neurons? And now if we're arguing that mitochondrial quality control via pink one Parkin mediates the loss of, this is required to maintain dopaminergic neurons, why? Why might these be especially dependent on mitochondrial quality control? And I'll just point out some thoughts people we've had in the literature. First of all, substantia nigra dopaminergic neurons, they are extensively armorized. They're so extensive in this little part of the brain with the total length of a single dopaminergic neuron is up to 4.5 meters. That's a massive amount of of, of, of lipid membrane to maintain. Second of all, there are one to two million synapses for a single dopaminergic neuron. And these are, and then combine this with pacemaker activity where they're firing like, like a drumbeat your whole life. This may, this is a hot, very high energetic demand and this energetic demand may explain the special requirement for taking good color, if you have damaged mitochondria, that, 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 that would occur due to this energy demand and, and, and need to lead to problems. And I'll get into that in a little bit about some of the problems that damaged mitochondria can cause. So as Derek mentioned, the pink one, Parkin, mutant Drosophila have a striking phenotype. And humans mutated in pink one and Parkin have a striking phenotype. But what has held up the field for, for, for a while had been the fact that pink one Parkin mutant mice don't have any substantial phenotype. They don't develop any Parkinsonian sim symptoms. So this kind of held us back as far as uh, figuring out the physiological significance. And we wanted to stress these mice in a mitochondria specific way. So I already showed you, you can exercise mice and that's stressful, but it stresses lots of things. But we got a mouse first developed by Niels Gorham Larson and also Tom Prola in, in Wisconsin called a mutator mouse. And this is a mouse. So I mentioned mitochondria have their own DNA and their own DNA has a, a dedicated DNA polymerase called polymerase gamma, pole G. It's in the mitochondria, it makes new mitochondrial DNA. And like all, like other DNA polymerases, it has a proofreading activity so that it doesn't make errors. But the proofreading activity can be mutated very subtly to make it error prone. So these, these scientists previously made error prone mice that are error prone specifically in the mitochondrial DNA. And they do, they, they accumulate mitochondrial uh, DNA mutations and they have a phenotype. They don't live as long as wild type mice. They uh, are thought to be perhaps an aging model and mitochondrial DNA mutation accumulation is one of the theories of aging, even in people, that we accumulate mitochondrial mutations as we age and, and this isn't healthy. So we knew that these mice had a phenotype and we knew that it was caused by mitochondrial DNA mutations. So we crossed the mutator mice with the um, Parkin knockout mouse that didn't have a phenotype. And uh, this is really nice work done by Alicia Pickrell, who's professor at Virginia Tech. She found and, and showed, and this has been confirmed by other labs, that if you, that there's no loss of dopaminergic and Parkin knockout mice. That's already been published. That's what the first people that made the Parkin knockout mice look for, and there's no phenotype. And it all also been previously reported that the mutator mouse doesn't have an accumulation of, uh, doesn't have any deficit in dopaminergic neurons. And if I don't, if I forget later, I just as an aside, there are human mutations in polymerase gamma that are functionally mutator. And some of those patients present with Parkinson's disease. So, but when we cross the mutator with the Parkin knockout, we saw about 50, 40 to 50% reduction in these brown staining neurons. This is the substantia nigra, and this is a stain for tyrosine hydroxylase that makes dopamine. 
And this is quite important because it shows that in these mice, endogenous parkin is required to prevent uh, loss of dopaminergic neurons due to a mitochondrial specific damage. Now, is this enough to cause any motor phenotypes? There's a very sensitive measure of mouse movement called a pole test, where you place a mouse at the top of a ring stand and they don't like to be exposed like that. They invariably run down quite rapidly. And this is wild type mice will run down this pole on average of five seconds. And as I mentioned, Parkin knockout mice are quite fine. They run down it pretty well, mutators as well. But in these mice that have lost their dopaminergic neurons, they clearly have a deficit in climbing down the pole. So they have some motor phenotype. But remember, these are whole body Parkin knockout, whole body mutator. Up until these experiments, many, many models have been made of Parkinson's disease, but they entailed making tissue specific knockouts or knock-ins. So some very important gene would be knocked out in the mitochondria or in the cell, just in dopaminergic neurons. So it was, it was a good model for Parkinson's disease, but the selectivity of whole body for this, sub, this compartment had not been identified. But my point is, so we don't know if this is due to the loss of dopaminergic neurons. This could be uh, muscle fatigue or heart disease. Or, since it's whole body, they could have problems all over the body. But we do know that in humans, L-DOPA treatment replaces the dopamine loss and that can improve people's motor function. So what we, were, we could do to test whether this defect in movement was due to loss of the dopaminergic neurons over here is give the mice L-DOPA. And these mice, a different cohort that couldn't climb down the pole, one hour after injecting them with L-DOPA, they could, indicating this motor phenotype is reflective of the dopaminergic neuron loss. And a couple other experiments in these mice, looking at, remember the substrate of pink one is phospho, uh, phosphoserine 65 ubiquitin using mass spec to determine that, showed a, a, a tripling level of this phosphoserine ubiquitin in the mutator mice, indicating pink one's working all the time. And we don't see that in the liver. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Derek and Min. I just wanna close with, some, some recent work from our collaborators in Germany who have large cohorts of pink one Parkin patients. And they looked at a number of things, but they looked at mitochondrial DNA in the serum of the patients based on the idea of, of mitophagy and of inflammation. And mute plus plus means it's, it's a biallelic mutant in either Parkin or pink one to get bigger cohorts. They summed up the pink one Parkin patients and they measured mitochondrial DNA. It's a standard laboratory test in hospitals because it's linked to, it's a bad prognosis for a number of things such as heart attacks. And they compared it most importantly with idiopathic Parkinson's disease and healthy controls. And they found a very substantial increase in, uh, in the level of, of um, mitochondrial DNA relative to idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So this, again, is consistent with the model in humans that pink one and Parkin are mediating mitophagy to eliminate damaged mitochondria. And without it, you can have this accumulation of mitochondrial DNA that can be inflammatory. I'll get to that later. It also could suggest that there's a different mechanism between Parkin and pink one mutants than with idiopathic Parkinson's disease and may be consistent with what Derek just talked about about alpha nuclei. However, these are rapid onset so it could be just a more acute process that's more easily detectable, leads to disease, and it's happening even in the idiopathic Parkinson's disease at a slow chronic rate that um, is harder to detect. Now I'm going to turn it back to Derek and we'll flip again. So the focus up until this point has really been on the pink one Parkin pathway. But as I mentioned at the start, there is another gene that's been recently associated with Parkinson's disease and uh, called CHCHD2. And this is different from Parkin and pink one in that um, with Parkin and pink one, it's really loss of function of these genes that causes disease. But with CHCHD2, it's a dominant mutation that leads to Parkinson's disease. And interestingly, CHCHD2 has a paralog called C10 
And dominant mutations in C10 also cause neurodegeneration, um, although not specifically Parkinson's disease. So these mutations cause a spectrum of neuromuscular disorders. And so to, this um, study of this has sort of broadened our interest out from just Parkinson's disease to thinking more about mitochondria dysfunction and neurodegeneration more generally. Um, so what are these proteins? So C2 and C10 are small mitochondrial proteins that are located in the mitochondrial Christi. Um, mitochondria have two membranes. They have an outer membrane and then they have an inner membrane. And that inner membrane forms these folds that um, go into the mitochondrial matrix. Um, so these are the Christi. And this increases the surface area for oxidative phosphorylation. So this is where the respiratory complexes are located and this is where the ATP synthase are located. So these Christi are very important for the bioenergetic function of mitochondria. And trying to maintain quality within these Christi are, is, is very important. And uh, C2 and C10 are these small proteins that we think may have a chaperone function that localize to these mitochondrial Christi, and in particular to the intermembrane space side of the mitochondrial Christi, as is shown here um, in these uh, immuno EM images. So this is what... Uh, a homology model of these proteins looks like. Um, we don't have any structural information of, um, from um, actual structural studies at this point, um, but there's at the C-terminus a uh, CHCH domain. Um, and then in the middle, there's an alpha helix um, that is where most of the mutations that are associated with disease are found. And this includes the Parkinson's disease causing mutation. That's a substitution of an isoleucine for a threonine um, at a particular residue. This was identified originally by Hattori's group in Japan um, in 2015. There were two families with dominant Parkinson's disease, both of which had this ultra rare mutation. And then a separate Chinese group identified a Chinese family with dominant Parkinson's disease that had the same substitution. So altogether, there are three families um, that have this very rare form of Parkinson's disease. As I mentioned, mutations in C10 cause really a spectrum of neuromuscular disorders. So there's a particular mutation uh, that res results in this glycine to valine substitution um, that has a founder effect in Finland. And there are about 100 patients in Finland that have this very specific adult onset form of spinal muscular atrophy called the Jokela type. And actually in this region of South um, East uh, Finland, this is the most common cause of motor neuron disease. It's even more common than ALS in that region. Um, but they just have motor neuron problems. They don't get muscle problems. There's another mutation, which was the first one described um, by a group in Nice, France. Um, it's this S59L mutation. And these patients will have um, a very complex phenotype that often includes both upper and lower motor neuron problems. So that's what we call uh, a term ALS. Um, and then also may have frontal temporal dementia. And then they usually have a mild myopathy um, in addition to those um, central nervous system and spinal cord um, um, findings. And then finally, there's a mutation that causes what's known as isolated mitochondrial myopathy dominant. So these individuals will have a generalized myopathy, but if you look at their motor neurons, um, for instance, using an EMG type test, um, you don't see any evidence of lower motor neuron problems like are seen in the other families with the other mutations. So there's a strict genotype phenotype correlation between these different mutations, even though they're very close to each other within the same protein, um, and the specific the, uh, correlation between the specific genotype you have and the specific phenotype that you end up getting. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about some work that we've been doing um, to characterize a family that has this myopathy causing G58R mutation. And we've been doing this in collaboration with Joe Poulton um, at Oxford, who first identified um, this family. Um, so I'm showing you the proband here, seen at eight years old, and you can see that there's both uh, wasting of uh, both uh, distal as well as proximal muscle groups, kind of generalized myopathy. Um, you can also see that there's some facial weakness. So on the picture on the right, um, he's trying to hold his um, kind of a neutral facial expression, but his, his mouth falls open a little bit because his facial muscles are weak. Um, but at this point, he's still able to stand and he's still able to walk around. Um, but 12 years later, he uh, was no longer able to walk. He was wheelchair brown, bound. And um, because of the weakness and the myopathy, um, he had developed contractures. And you can see that his um, arms and legs are sort of held in, the, in, a, in a particular posture like that. 
In addition to the myopathy, he also had a cardiomyopathy. And this was severe enough that he needed a heart transplant. And unfortunately, because of the immunosuppression, he developed lymphoma and he died um, shortly after this uh, second picture was taken at 20 years of age. This was his family. Um, he had a brother who was older, who also had the same mutation and had died in childhood um, of a myopathy and cardiomyopathy. Um, and his mom also um, had a childhood onset myopathy, cardiomyopathy, and had died at a young age, at the age of 34. Um, and I won't go through the, the, the whole pedigree, but we think it was probably a de novo mutation in mom. And the grandparents weren't affected, the great grandparents weren't affected. So this is a mutation that um, um, seemed to have arose um, 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 in mom for the first time and caused this really severe, um, highly penetrant form of the disease. So a MD-PhD student in my lab, uh, Mario Seamus, has been characterizing a mouse model of this uh, disorder that we've, that we've generated. So in the mouse CHCHD10 gene, we have knocked in um, to the equivalent um, um, gene, uh, the G58R mutation. And if the mice are heterozygous for this mutation, so it's this, the same situation that we have in the proband, um, we see a recapitulation of the proband's phenotype. So these mice have decreased body weight. Their body weight's about half that of their litter mates. Um, if you test their grip strength, they have decreased grip strength consistent with the myopathy. And if you do echocardiography, you find that their um, heart function is greatly reduced. Um, so really a very good model for what we see in the patient. And one thing that's interesting to point out is if you knock out C10 alone, or even if you knock out C2 and C10, you don't get this phenotype. And you can see in the, the bottom picture there on the left, um, this is a double knockout mouse that we've generated. Um, and they don't have the same um, um, weight loss that you see in the G58R. So this is what we call a gain of function mutation. And we think it's a, a what we would call for a term a, a toxic gain of function. So this mutation is causing this protein to do something that the protein doesn't normally do. Um, so Mario went on to see what was um, happening with this protein when you have this mutation. Um, and looking in affected tissues, here I'm showing you the, the heart muscle, um, but you also see it in the skeletal muscle. If you stain for CHCHD10, this mutation is causing the protein to misfold and form these aggregates that actually are still localized inside of mitochondria. And so we think that what these mutations are doing is they're forming these toxic aggregates that then have a negative impact on the mitochondrial function. And this is causing disease in these very um, mitochondrial dependent tissues like um, uh, muscle and, and heart, as well as um, um, neurons that are affected in some of the other disorders. And this seems to be a uh, common mechanism in uh, the C2, C10 related neurodegeneration. There have been, there not been a lot of reports of autopsy studies, but there have been a couple. There was one from Hattori's group. So he's the one who originally did, identified this Parkinson's disease causing T61I mutation. Um, and they, they followed their patients and one of them unfortunately passed away. And at autopsy, um, they found that the uh, CCHD2 protein would form these inclusions within um, neurons that are affected, you know, these dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. And in some cases, these inclusions are separate from alpha synuclein, but in other uh, cases, they're actually seen in the Lewy bodies. So they hypothesize that this misfolded C2 might actually seed the misfolding of alpha synuclein and might be causing Parkinson's disease in that way. Um, similarly, there is a uh, mutation that causes ALS in C10. And there was an, a case that came to autopsy. They looked in the lower motor neurons and the spinal cord. And what they found was that C10 would form these corkscrew-like aggregates that's not seen in typical ALS cases and isn't seen in healthy controls. Um, so we think that probably a common mechanism of disease is that these mutations are causing the proteins to misfold. Probably the specific uh, mutation will cause the protein to misfold in slightly different ways and form slightly different toxic species that may affect motor neurons more in one case and will affect muscle cells more in another case. Maybe that's why we get this genotype phenotype correlation that we see. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Richard who will uh, tell you more about a different kind of uh, mitochondrial disease, those that are due to mitochondrial DNA mutations themselves.
Okay, just a few last slides to talk about maternal inherited diseases to try to broaden the scope from Parkinson's disease to the, the diseases Derek talked about in a, in a, a very interesting series of, of uh, maternally inherited diseases. So as we know, we know we're gonna know for the quiz at the end of the, the quiz at the end of the lecture series, mitochondria have their own DNA. Unlike any other organelle in animals, uh, chloroplasts also have their own DNA, but so there's uh, its own DNA and this is prone to, to mutations, like I mentioned in the mutator mouse. And now, as, as we get, as, as, with, during age, we accumulate mutations. So how come, and also the, the, the repair, the, the, the DNA repair process in the mitochondria is, 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 is not nearly as effective as in the, the, the nuclear DNA. They, they don't have like recombination, for example. So there's this old adage, Mueller's ratchet, where what keeps these mitochondria from accumulating mutations as you get older? And then what about through generations and generations of people for thousands of years? What keeps the, the mitochondrial genome intact? And what keeps it intact is the fact that mitochondria are inherited maternally. So eggs, oocytes in women or female, in female um, mammals or higher mammals have hundreds of thousands of mitochondria copies of their DNA per oocyte. And they're fertilized by a sperm that only has got like 10 copies. And those are likely eliminated. So almost all of us are more genetically related to our mothers than our fathers. And 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 in and the, and the the beauty is the mother that the oocytes during oogenesis it purifies the mitochondrial DNA, it eliminates deleterious mutations, and beyond just eliminating deleterious mutations, there's a bottleneck, so that even if there's a benign mutation, it's thought that that could lead if you have three different you know haplotypes of mitochondrial DNA in a cell even though they're all benign, it could lead to some kind of uh, evolutionary competition between the mitochondria in, in one cell. And that's one idea why it doesn't happen, but there's a bottleneck so that most healthy oocytes at maturity are homoplastic, meaning they only have one sequence of mitochondrial DNA, despite their ancestors accumulation of mitochondria DNA through their lifetime. So it's purified and bottlenecked during oogenesis but it's not foolproof and mutations do slip through. And if they're in, so the, here, this is a, the, the oogenesis and here's the mature primary oocytes and they can have trace amounts of mitochondrial DNA mutations in red that don't really affect the offspring or they can have moderate ones that have intermediate effects or they can have high loads of deleterious mutant uh, mitochondria. And this leads to a whole host of different human diseases. And it, the disease can depend on, on the gene that's mutated in the mitochondrial DNA or on the, on the level of the, uh, the damaged DNA. Now the DNA encodes for 13 polypeptide chains. Now I mentioned earlier on that originally there's a, there's a, a bacterium that was engulfed in symbiotic and it had tens of thousands of genes but those have migrated mainly over a billion years to the nucleus. So one wonders, well, why are there 13 retained? And these 13 are all in the electron transport chains and they're all very hydrophobic. So one theory, one idea, hypothesis is if those got imported into the nucleus, they couldn't, the polypeptide chain could not be re-imported the mitochondria, they're so hydrophobic. They need to be made inside the mitochondria. And so mitochondria translate their own, these polypeptide chains, they have their own tRNAs and their own ribosomal RNAs. And mitochondrial diseases arise from mutations in either the tRNAs or in the, 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 electron, the proteins that are in the electron transport chain. So there's no effective treatment for these children. And uh, there's a range, they range from like uh, vision problems to myopathy, to heart disease. 
depending on all these factors. So there's an interesting, uh, a very, uh, a very nice system has been developed for 20 years on how to study this. And it's mainly done in cell lines. So you can take a cell line that's got wild type green mitochondrial DNA sequence. And then you can take the platelets from the patients that have these mutations, that have the disease. And platelets don't have nuclear DNA. So one can simply fuse the platelets with a, 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 a control cell line and it's called a cybrid cell line. And they can be made with different mutations like tRNAs or proteins or there can be different levels of the protein. So we've been thinking about the potential to use what we learned about mitophagy and pink one parkin to activate this pathway to treat Parkinson's disease patients or other mitochondrial disease patients like the ones Derek talked about or these maternally inherited diseases. So we tested that by taking a cybrid cell line that, that that uh, we collaborated with Giovanni Manfredi at, at uh, New York City. And, and this is his cybrid cell line. This has a mutation in cytochrome oxidase. So here's the wild type sequence. And here's the mutant. This patient was very ill and, uh, and she couldn't walk. And this mutation generated a new restriction enzyme site. So we could look at the degree of heteroplasma. So there's a mix of wild type and a mix of mutant. We could test that by using this restriction enzyme. So if you take control wild type cells, just like in most of us, and you add that restriction enzyme, you're gonna get two bands. But if you look at the cybrid cell line that we made with that, with, with, between these two, we see it's mostly the lower band, which is that band. The smaller band runs off the gel. But you can see it, you may can't not see it there, but there's a faint, faint band of wild type mitochondrial DNA in this, in this gel. And if we express Parkin in these cells, if we overexpress Parkin, that would be the idea like activating Parkin for 45 days. You can see that there's a dramatic shift from the deleterious mutant to the wild type mutant. And you can see there's still a faint amount there remaining. And we did some experiments where if we put these back into culture, this accumulates over time. And this is, this is a, a vector control and this is no treatment whatsoever. So this is the original state. And if we take these and we go for 60 days, 15 more days, it's, it's, almost, it's undetectable at, at this level. And now this is at the DNA level. We can also measure cytochrome oxidase activity. And this is the activity in wild type. And this is the level in the cybers. It's, it's very low expressing Parkin for 45 or 60 days, not only restores the wild type DNA, but restores cytochrome oxidase activity. So if we could activate Parkin, we might be able to treat more than Parkinson's disease. We might be able to treat a host of other mitochondrial related diseases. And maybe, you know, mitochondrial mutations accumulate with age. So there could be a lot of potential. So we've looked for drugs to treat this pathway. And I had a, we worked with NCATS, Jim Inglish up there. And this is like the size of a 96 well plate, but it's got 1,536 wells. And this is used for high throughput drug screening. So there's a proof of principle. We looked at pink one levels and we treated 10 micromolar CCCP that Derek originally discovered. And we can see the variability in these wells. It's a very good assay. So we could do a 400,000 compound screen with, with NCATS and we did that. But just as an example of what we found, uh, this is a collection of 1200 clinically approved agents, dr drugs in the US, Europe, and Japan. And we can do this in dose. And what we've got here is a little, um, dose response of CCCP that we know activates, stabilizes pink one, five micromolar, 10 and 20. And very low dose of this collection, not much happens. Increase the dose. And you can see here at, um, at this, I can't see because of the, the, the screen, but you see a little bit of an increase in this pink one there. And it's even more at this level. So this is more potent than CCCP. And this is a clinically approved compound. And its name is niclosamid. And interestingly, Miratil Muckett in Dundee, the guy who also discovered phosphorylation ubiquitin, also stumbled on the same compound that could be used to activate this pathway.
So we, uh, that's about as far as we got because a number of companies have gotten into this field and there's a lot of interest in, in, in activating this pathway for a host of diseases. And I'll just mention companies are exploring drug targets and drugs. Genentech reported a mitochondrial deubiquitinase, USB30, opposes Parkin mediated mitophagy. And that's what big pharma likes, likes to make inhibitors. So if they find a protein, a deubiquitinase, that opposes Parkin, then if you have a drug that inhibits the inhibitor, you activate Parkin. And this has spawned a number of smaller startup companies who are looking for USB30 inhibitors to activate the pathway. Novartis, they've done genome-wide CRISPR screens for the regulators uh, to identify drug targets. And Merck, I particularly like this recent paper in 2021 from Merck because they, they are looking at TNF leading to mitochondrial DNA release. The same process I talked about showing in the Parkin patients, they have mitochondrial DNA in their blood and it activates this innate immune pathway. And I particularly like this paper because the senior author is our own Richard Siegel, who I've known for many years in Building 10, and now he's a director at Merck, and he led this study, and it's nice to see him getting into mitochondrial DNA. And just quick, quickly, Biogen has reported discovery of small molecule allosteric activators of Parkin. MindRank AI in China has identified two compounds. And AbbVie recently, just very recently, acquired a compound from a small company called Mitokinin that activates pink one kinase. And they're taking that into clinical trials for Parkinson's disease. So hopefully this very basic work can be translated you know, in completely unanticipated uh, blue sky research can, can end up helping people without being targeted that way in the beginning. And I just want to thank, of course, Derek, you know, and I just listed my postdocs that are first authors on the papers that I presented their data. And Jobbert, the, the, all these postdocs are flanked by two graduate students. I love graduate students, Derek Narendra and Jobbert Vargas. And my collaborators whose work I've shown, and this is my current lab. And I just want to point out in the very center of my lab is Black, who's helps all these people and has helped me mentor all these prior students. And I just want to thank uh, Win Arias and Dan Kastner for hosting this talk and for this uh, whole seminar series. And I thank the audience and all you postbacks out there. And Derek's going to have the last word. So um, just to acknowledge a, a couple of individuals for the, the work that I was talking about. Um, so Mario Seamus is pictured here. He's an MD-PhD in the OxCam program right now. And um, he's done uh, that work on the, the, the story that I presented on the mouse model um, with a lot of help from um, our, our lab manager, um, who also does a, a lot of great work at the bench, um, Xiaoping um, Hyung. Um, and we have a really great group that's come together. And we've had um, some good co collaborations with um, Joe Poulton that I mentioned at Oxford, um, as well as um, with Andy Singleton's group and um, um, some, several of the individuals in his lab um, that have been very helpful for the work that we've been doing. Um, so with that, um, we'll, we'll stop and uh, welcome um, any questions that you might have for us. Well, thank you so, so much, Derek and Richard. This has really been just a treat uh, you know, hearing about uh, your work and these uh, important pathways, and I just think it's it's so exciting and fantastic. So we do have questions uh, from the audience, and uh, the first question one could uh, say that maybe this is this was a premature question in the sense that the um, interrogator uh, submitted the question before the whole story was was. Uh, unveiled. Uh, but it does raise some additional questions. Uh, so we'll kind of riff off of this question, perhaps. So, so the question is, uh, what is it about the dopamine neurons that make them so sensitive to Park and Park 1, uh, Pink 1 uh, deficiency? And we already heard a little bit about that in terms of the energy requirements of, of these huge um, uh, cells that are, are uh, uh, at least based in the substantial substantia nigra. Uh, so I think that we've 
kind of address that a little bit, although, you know, you can tell me that I got it all wrong uh, if you want. Um, uh, but then, you know, maybe we can uh, expand that a little bit and say, well, what about other cells that have pacemaker activity? You know, um, is there some problem uh, in the SA node, in the sinoatrial node or the uh, AV node uh, uh, in the heart, uh, you know, in the pacemaker uh, cells in the heart? Uh, in individuals that have um, Parkinson disease due to uh, Parkin or PINK1 deficiency? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's an, it's, it's an excellent question. And, um, you know, um, just to talk about Parkinson's disease more generally, you know, we think of substantia nigra neurons as being particularly affected, but um, there are other neuronal groups that are also affected, like their brainstem neurons um, that express norepinephrine that are affected, and um, their um, uh, uh, neurons in the vagus nerve that, that are affected. One thing that they seem to have in common is they, they often are projection neurons. And so, like Richard was mentioning in his talk, you know, they tend to have these very large axonal arbors. And so you have one little cell body. Um, where you know, some people think that that's where the lysosomes are. And so actually, if you want to turn over a mitochondria, you have to transport that dysfunctional mitochondria all the way from that axon down to that cell body. And if you have a little cell body that has to support this enormous arbor of um, you know, different axons, then that may create a, an extra challenge for um, sort of dealing with quality control there. Um, I don't know if Richard has um, other thoughts about it. Yeah, I, yeah, I just want to rip on this even more to kind of point out how how much more we have to learn because we talked about dopaminergic neurons, all this stuff. What about in the Drosophila? Why do they lose flight muscles? You know, I think <laughs> yeah. uh, connections with inflammation, but uh, it's still uh, early days for that. But there's there's a lot of mysteries, to it. and I think Dan. In a lot of diseases, you know, I think in hindsight, we see, oh, this mutation caused this disease. And we, in hindsight, we rationalize it. But, you know, in ALS, you know, it's not so clear why, you know, TBK1 or, or opting or mutated in those diseases. So I think this is, there's a lot to learn. And I, I guess I also, I think that our different cells in our body are very specialized and have different requirements. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mentioned ALS and, and Derek uh, showed us that very nice uh, graph um, uh, in which uh, one can plot uh, the uh, frequency of, of variants in the population and their effect, uh, you know, whether or not you, you have, uh, you know, a highly penetrant uh, mutation or just a susceptibility locus. And, and so that makes one think a little bit perhaps about uh, the possible relationship between common variants that are observed in idiopathic Parkinson's disease and common variants that are found in other neurodegenerative diseases. Because, you know, in autoimmune diseases, oftentimes we see variants in the you know, same or similar genes that predispose to various different autoimmune diseases. And, and I believe that in uh, psychiatric diseases, there's uh, some overlap amongst the susceptibility loci for different psychiatric disorders. So uh, amongst the movement disorders, um, is there any sort of relationship, uh, say, between uh, the common variants that are associated with idiopathic Parkinson's disease and common variants that are associated with, uh, with other um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases? Yeah, um, yeah. There's been some very nice work um, uh, by my colleague um, Sonia Schultz, and you know, also by Andy Singleton's group that sort of looked at, you know, common variants in these different neurodegenerative disorders, and to what degree is there overlap, and to what degree are things different. Um, it seems like there, as a rule, there is not like they're all connected to each other, but there are some specific connections, um, and in particular. Some patients with Parkinson's disease end up with a lot of cognitive problems. Actually, they can end up with dementia. And they can end up with a dementia that looks a lot like a form of dementia called dementia with Lewy bodies. 
And if you look at the overlap in the polygenic risk of Parkinson's disease and Lewy body, there is a lot of overlap there. But then if you look at Lewy body dementia and other disorders like Alzheimer's disease, there's actually overlap there. So it's almost like you have this Venn diagram where there's some overlap between PD and dementia with Lewy bodies and then with dementia Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's disease, but not so much between Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Um, so definitely there is some overlap, but it's not like everything is overlapping with everything else. Um, there seem to be there's some very specific connections between specific diseases. So presumably, as we get to the bottom of mechanisms of these things that may become more clear, why there could be this sort of uh, second degree association between Parkinson's disease susceptibility, loci, and Alzheimer's disease susceptibility, for example. Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. So uh, here's another uh, question. Um, uh, starts out with a comment. Great talk. Uh, what are your thoughts about the role of pink one Parkin during steady state basal mitophagy and in different cell types, for example, neurons versus macrophages? So they're bringing macrophages into the, uh, the picture here. Yeah, um, there certainly are other mechanisms of mitophagy, and I'll start talking about this, and then I think uh, Richard will, will chime in as well. Um, you know, so, so we know that that... Um, you know, that, that there are other mechanisms of mitophagy that don't depend on Parkin and PINK1. Some of those are described and are known to depend on other mitophagy receptors like um, Nix and BNIP and some others that are out there. Um, yeah, um, and, and so clearly that there is basal mitophagy that isn't fully dependent on the PINK1 Parkin pathway. We have always sort of thought of the PINK1 Parkin pathway as more of a damage control uh, more of a damage response pathway. So more important for um, quality control when there's a specific damage. Um, but during development, for instance, it seems that there's this other protein called Nix that seems to be particularly important. Um, so your red blood cells actually don't have mitochondria. And so as they progress into uh, mature red blood cells, they have to get rid of their mitochondria. And there's this other protein called Nix that's important for that programmed elimination of mitochondria. Um, and it seems that in developing neurons, Nix might also be important for helping get rid of mitochondria as those neurons are developing. Um, so certainly there are these redundant mitophagy pathways in addition to the pink one Parkin pathway. Yes, the only thing I'd like to add to that is, is that neurons are special in that they don't turn over. You know, we've got our Anoply for the rest of our lives. They may be more dependent on this than, for example, on metaphoric cells that turn over quickly. You've got apoptosis, you make new ones and they die, and it's, you don't die as a consequence. But I do think macrophages and T cells, uh, there's a bit of literature on when they're activated, this pathway can be activated as well. Uh huh. And so uh, actually, uh, um, Derek, what you just said about red cells not having um, uh, mitochondria, that's, that actually is news to me, but of course there's lots of things that <laughs> may be news to me. So, uh, so uh, they don't have any way of, of uh, generating energy. Uh, so, so they're completely dependent on glycolysis for, for their... their... Uh, I see, I see. Of course, of course, yes. Yeah. Um, so then uh, along the lines of, of uh, mitophagy and other mechanisms of Parkinson's disease, of course, you, you mentioned uh, glucocerebrosidase and uh, variants in glucocerebrosidase. Uh, uh, in fact, there's a variant uh, that's common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population that's, that's associated with uh, Gaucher disease. That's a relatively common uh, cause of, of Parkinson's disease. And, and so there you can think perhaps about uh, the lysosome and, um, and its role. So do you think that things that screw up the lysosome and, and thereby um, inhibit mitophagy, that that's, that that's the mechanism or could be the mechanism for, for those kinds of disorders? And are there other lysosomal disorders that, that uh, lead to a problem with mitophagy and thereby uh, a problem with uh, you know, uh, keeping mitochondria um, 
you know, uh, damage control of mitochondria. Yeah, the, um, the lysosome does just seem to be sort of a, a common endpoint in, in all of this Parkinson's disease, um, um, you know, molecular mechanisms. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, GBA is involved in the lysosome, probably LARC2 and BPS13, some other genes that are associated with Parkinson's disease are primarily affecting the lysosome, also ATP 13A2. Um, and it's known that alpha synuclein is turned over through um, the lysosome as well, through um, chaperone-mediated autophagy. Um, and one idea is that, um, you know, perhaps the problem could start in, you know, either, either place, you know, that you could have something that causes, else that causes problems um, in the lysosome and that, that would disrupt metophagy or perhaps metophagy could disrupt what else is going on in the lysosome or mitochondrial damage could, and that would disrupt turnover of alpha synuclein, you know, but, but certainly it seems that there's a convergence at the, at the lysosome for, you know, turnover both of mitochondria and then also these misfolded proteins like alpha synuclein. Um, and then the other major pathway that seems to be affected is endocytosis, which will also sort of feed into that same um, endolysosomal system. Um, so, so yeah, definitely a point of convergence there. Okay, and then speaking of cellular trash cans, uh, you know, so the lysosome comes to mind, uh, but then what about the proteasome? Um, are there any um, issues with the proteasome that would lead to uh, Parkinson's disease? I'm, I'm just asking. Uh, I, uh, you know, this just occurred to me <laughs> as you were talking. <laughs> so <laughs> this is not a thought up question. This is just, you know, an idea that popped into my head at this very moment. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you, you know, you, you might, if you're, if you're thinking of, you know, good candidates to look at, you might think that the UPS would be a good candidate. And, you know, certainly if you knock out the proteasome subunit and the substantia nigra neurons, they'll degenerate, you know, like, perhaps that's not surprising. Um, but at least from the genetics, there hasn't been many signals there. You know, there's not um, a lot of um, um, genetics telling us that that's what um, is going awry in either the familial forms of the disease or the sporadic forms of the disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's another question from the audience. Uh, what is the reason uh, the mitochondrial DNA mutator model is required to see Parkinson's disease manifestations in the mouse model? How does this relate to human disease models? And that's, that's a great question. Why don't the mice have any phenotype? It's, uh, it's been a, you know, a conundrum for the field since they were discovered. I just, we don't know. They seem to be less dependent on, on mitochondrial quality control than in humans. And I do, there is a, to make it even more confusing, like we said a minute ago, Drosophila has muscle phenotype. And now there is a pink one that mutant rat has been developed. And they've got a peripheral neuropathy. I mean, go figure. So I kind of joke when I talk about this, like, I mean, if Eagle had a pink one mutation, maybe it would have vision problems. You know, it might be that different species have different, uh, different cell types that are particularly demanding for their, their niche. And uh, maybe we, by walking on two feet, <laughs> we require more balance than a, than a mouse. Who knows? But that's a great question. I don't have the answer. All right, well, so uh, here's another question from the audience. Um, vesicular uptake, release, and recycling of dopamine require energy. Could a mitochondrial lesion cause Parkinsonism without actual death of substantia nigra neurons? Yeah, the, 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 there's um, some interesting recent evidence, um, both from autopsy material and also from mouse models that, um, there may be less actual cell death than we thought and more neurons that lose their expression of the typical markers of dopamine neurons. You know, so if you're staining for a marker of a dopamine neuron like tyrosine hydroxylase, you may not see the neuron there anymore. That may be because the neuron's dead and not there, or maybe because it's no longer expressing tyrosine hydroxylase. And it seems that at least early on, the response of these neurons is to lose expression of some of these dopamine-defining um, enzymes. 
Um, and um, from a mouse model, from a work that was recently uh, reported by Jim Surmeyer um, at Northwestern, um, if you use other methods like neuronal tracing methods to see if those neurons are still there, despite the fact that they've lost TH, you can find them. Um, and there was a recent single cell um, sequencing study from Parkinson's disease brains. And they um, you know, find that there's a class of neurons that's only seen in the PD brains that look like dopamine neurons, except they're no longer expressing the typical dopamine markers that may be the same thing that Jim Surmeyer is looking at in his mouse model. Um, so we, we do think that something like that might be going on. Um, that doesn't explain all of it, um, you know, because even if you just do total neuronal counts in that region, you'll see that there's a decrease. But there may be this population of at-risk neurons that haven't actually died yet, but they've just lost expression of their typical markers. I see. Okay, well, that sounds interesting. So, so here's another question from the audience. Um, uh, this is something I'd never heard of before. Uh, there are reports that appendectomy protects against Parkinson's. Do you believe this? Yeah, so, so, so I, I think the basis of that is, um, you know, it turns out that alpha-synuclein, I showed you before that alpha-synuclein misfolds in, um, in cells in your skin. Um, so it turns out that it misfolds in, in nerve fibers throughout your body, and that includes the nerve fibers that innervate your gut. And there's a hypothesis that, you know, eventually those nerve fibers will project up to a part of your um, 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 brainstem called, uh, um, the, uh, called the vagus um, nucleus. And, and so there's been some idea that there's this um, ascending pathology that maybe starts in the gut and will ascend up those nerve fibers to the brainstem. And then it you know, kind of continues and progresses to involve the brain. And maybe there's even you know, something, a uh, gut pathogen or something that might help induce this process to start. Um, so there have been some clever epidemiologists that have looked at people who've had vagotomies versus those who haven't had vagotomies and if they're at increased risk of Parkinson's disease. And there's about a, a twofold difference. So there's a little bit of a signal there. Um, you know, but I, I think probably the, um, my view of it is that we all undergo prophylactic uh, appendectomy uh, to uh, ward off the possibility of Parkinson's. That's right. I, I'm not recommending that. Okay. All right. Well, that's um, reassuring. Um, so uh, other questions that we have, um, uh, are there environmental factors? that influence susceptibility to Parkinson's. And, and actually one uh, member of the group uh, just uh, put in a question about cigarette smoking uh, as being a possible environmental factor. Yeah, the, I mean, the two that have the clearest signal are um, smoking as the person asking the question brought up. Um, so actually smoking is protective for Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. But they don't put that on the cigarette packs. <laughs> You know, you know, but but of course, it's not clear if there's a hidden variable or not. You know, I mean, could it be that um, something about um, the dopamine system is different in those who are most likely to become addicted to cigarettes versus those who don't, and that that's kind of what's mediating this relationship? Like I, I like to think of it as maybe motorcycle racers are also not prone to getting Parkinson's disease. <laughs> That's like a resilience factor in their risk-taking ability. The, the other environmental factor is, um, uh, you know, either having grown up in a rural area or being exposed to well water or being exposed to pesticides. I mean, some of the, the actually the original I idea that linked um, mitochondrial dysfunction, or one of the original ideas was that there's this toxic exposure and that some of those toxins will lead to inhibition of mitochondrial function. Um, and, there, and there's uh, probably the best evidence is for one called Paraquat, um, which is used, but um, th there's some epidemiological evidence that, that um, pesticide exposure may increase risk. And there's also a, a negative correlation with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. They, they may be protected. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Uh, well, that's uh, that's very very interesting. Um, so then, um, other questions that we have uh, here. Um, uh, Richard uh, mentioned some of the work, uh, recent work from Richard Siegel, uh, having to do with uh, inflammation and uh, uh, 
mitophagy and and uh, uh, the release of of DNA and and its possible role in in these pathways. Uh, are there any data with regard to? Well, you mentioned non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, but any other uh, data with regard to uh, inhibition of of uh, interferon, since uh, interferon is is triggered by the TBK1 uh, pathway in the in the sting. Uh, pathway or um, uh, interleukin one uh, triggered by uh, the the inflammasome. Yeah, yes, there's a, a long, long history of clinical studies showing higher inflammatory markers in Parkinson's disease patients. What has been less clear is whether it's cause or effect. It's a definite correlation and people could say it's causing it. And that there's like two schools of thought <laughs> that's causing it or that neurodegeneration leads to inflammation. I, I would say, I think the sh shifting more towards cause and, and more pharmaceutical companies are thinking about sting inhibitors and anti-inflammatories, but it's, uh, it's not that clear yet. Okay. All right. But certainly uh, an area of, uh, of, uh, interest in terms of uh, further investigation. Absolutely. Okay, so here's another question from the audience. Uh, given mitophagy requiring uh, lysosomal removal, this supposes retrograde transport must also be intact and could even uh, more could be even more upstream. Is there evidence that risk genes in retrograde transport are sufficient to cause Parkinson's disease? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of, I mean, if you're, if you're talking specifically about um, like the Dillian forms of Parkinson's disease or GWAS hits, I, I don't think any of the machinery that's involved um, um, has, has really come up as, as a hit. Um, there, there are um, mutations in dynamin that will cause something called Perry syndrome that can have Parkinsonism, but it looks very different than Parkinson's disease. That might be the, you know, kind of the closest connection. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so um, the relationship between um, uh, Parkinson's disease that's associated with uh, Parkin or PINK1 and um, idiopathic Parkinson's disease, are there any lessons that we uh, can take from the these monogenic forms of, of Parkinson's disease and apply them perhaps to possible uh, new treatments for the idiopathic form of the disease. Um, so, so Richard mentioned this, this, you know, now we have a biomarker for pink one park inactivity with phosphoubiquitin. And there've been some nice studies that have looked at phosphoubiquitin activation in sporadic PD, and it clearly is activated in the neurons that are affected in sporadic PD. So metophagy seems to be activated um, you know, whether or not it is, you know, actually protective in that setting or um, is just sort of incidental to everything else that's going on is not clear. Um, in terms of the some of the other monogenic forms of Parkinson's disease, I mean, clearly there is a relationship between the genetic form and the sporadic form. Um, Alpha-synuclein, you know, those were the first mutations identified. That's the protein that misfolds in idiopathic Parkinson's disease. It's thought to be a real driver of idiopathic disease. Um, and I mentioned, you know, these common polymorphisms from GWAS studies versus these Mendelian genes. It's notable that a lot of those um, polymorphisms that, that are seen in the GWAS studies are in the same genes as in the monogenic causes. So there seems to be a relationship between the polygenic burden that the average person has and then what's happening in these um, Mendelian forms of the disease. Uh -huh. And uh, you mentioned polygenic version, so uh, uh, burden. Um, so uh, has anyone come up with a polygenic risk score uh, for Parkinson's disease, uh, you know, to, to uh, assess uh, someone's risk of developing it if, if they don't have one of the uh, Mendelian forms? Yeah, they, um, they have. Um, so, um, uh, you know, Andy Siegelton's group in particular has, um, you know, come up with risk scores like this, and um, they're, um, you, you know, they, they seem to be um, fairly, you know, fairly predictive. Um, I mean, obviously not perfectly predictive. If I'm remembering 
some of the data, right, if you look at, you know, the top um, quintile versus the lowest quintile, maybe there's a fourfold difference between those groups, you know, so, it, um, you know, if you happen to have a lot of these, um, you're four times more likely than somebody who happens to have very few of these. Uh -huh. So not a huge increase, but still a, a, an increase. Um, so then another uh, area of interest in Parkinson's disease is, is this whole uh, issue of deep brain stimulation and uh, uh, the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Can you link that into your work in, in some way? Or what do you think is, uh, or maybe it's already known and, and uh, the questioner just doesn't know. Uh, um, is there some mechanism by which deep brain stimulation may help uh, in Parkinson's disease? Yeah, um, I, mean, I think it's probably best to think of it as a symptomatic treatment. Um, you're not doing anything probably to affect the neurodegeneration that's happening but the neurodegeneration is causing a circuit problem and the DBS is fixing the circuit problem. Um, so the, the symptoms obviously go with the circuit problem and not the degeneration. So if you can fix the circuit problem, you can fix that. Um, and it seems that DBS works as well in Parkin patients and PINK1 patients as it does in idiopathic PD patients. In fact, it, you know, in some cases it might work a little bit better um, because they don't get some of the complications, cognitive complications that idiopathic PD patients do. Um, so that, that also tells you that the, the circuit dysfunction in these genetic forms is the, probably the same as idiopathic PD. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let me see if there are any other uh, questions here. I think that we're um, now getting into redundancies, uh, you know, in terms of uh, questions. Uh, here's, here's one. I think that we've already kind of ruled out uh, uh, this is a possibility, but I'll just ask it. Uh, uh, are there any foods that would slow the progression of uh, Parkinson's disease? Um, I mean, usually what we recommend to patients is just to have a healthy diet. Um, you know, I, but I, I don't know of any good data to suggest that, you know, a particular food um, would, you know, slow progression of the disease. Uh -huh. I don't have thoughts about that. No, I, I don't and conversely, there would be nothing that you could eat that would make it worse. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's nothing specifically that that um, that that, that ex except herbicide treated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, right. <laughs> yes. Wash, wash, wash your vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well. Yeah. We we should. <laughs> yes, within reason. <laughs> One can have a a. a um, a liberal diet, I guess one could say. All right. Well, I think that that sort of uh, brings us to uh, the the end of the list of questions, and and also uh, nearly to the top of the hour. So, unless you guys have something more to add, you know, now that we've had this uh, this little interchange, perhaps there's something more that you would want to add uh, in the, the uh, last couple of minutes. Yeah, I, I want to add one thing. I mean. First of all, what a joy to have worked with Derek for such a long time. And it is a lot easier giving a lecture and answering the questions with, with this genius next to <laughs> you, you know, and, and vice versa, you know, it's been um, just a wonderful collaboration over the years. You know, I mean, this was really my first foray into science coming to the NIH as a medical student. and. Um, I think the, the, you know, the program to try to bring young physician scientists into science really, you know, you know, worked and, you know, it's great mentors like Richard that um, I, I think made that possible for me. Well, see, you know, B.F. Skinner, who developed the Skinner box and the idea of positive reinforcement, and he was interviewed late in life by Life magazine, and they asked Skinner, in your experience in, in civilization in the world, what is the greatest example of positive reinforcement you've ever seen. You know what Skinner said? Early, yeah. early success in science. <laughs> <laughs> he's got it. He's got, he's got the bug. <laughs> wow. Well, anyway, uh, it's really just a joy uh, having an opportunity to, to uh, hear you guys present today and to, to uh, interact with you in the question and answer session. Thank you so, so much for, uh, for a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, presentation. And uh, I will call things to a close and encourage everyone to come back uh, next week 
uh, when we will have another exciting installment uh, in the Demystifying Medicine series. So thank you all very much and, and have a great e evening, everyone. Good night. <laughs>